good morning, everyone, and um, warm greetings from Yale Bridges um, in Kenya to all our participants and panelists. Um, I'll be your moderator today, Lisa Chirodo, Head of Sales and Marketing at uh, Yale Bridges. And with us is also our host for today, whose uh, name is Steve Mambo, the COO of Yale Bridges. So today we'll be joined by three amazingly skilled women um, who in various capacities lead in the field of technology and cybersecurity. But before I ask them to introduce themselves, um, we need to just adhere to some housekeeping rules. Um, so all participants to, should Please and kindly have their audio on mute, just in case um, of an, any unnecessary interruption. So please have your audio settings on mute. Um, should you also have any questions directed to the panelists, do share them on the chat section. Um, also, should you also want to direct a particular question to a panelist, request the moderator to allow you to speak. And lastly, um, we really hope that we'll have a very interactive and worthwhile section uh, interaction. So, um, great. So before we can uh, do anything, um, we'll ask the ladies to introduce themselves. So Pauline, uh, you can introduce yourself and then we'll have Samari and then we'll have Diana introduce themselves. Okay, good morning everybody and welcome. My name is Pauline Warue a seasoned career woman who has been in the, most of the telcos in this country. Uh, last row being director of Safaricom Limited Customer Management. I now have my own company. It's called East Africa Customer Care, where we do consultancy in uh, areas of customer experience, strategy, training in customer experience, entrepreneurship, and brand. We also build contact centers or engagement centers for businesses from scratch, training, recruitment, up to operations. So welcome on board. Hope to share more as we speak. Lastly, I'm a mother to one, Hank. So I, I juggle a lot of roles even when I'm doing, I'm working. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, Samari? Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you, Yale Bridges. Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Samari Kachibale. I'm an info security, infosec spe specialist. Um, I've gained a wealth of experience with working, uh, working with various uh, national, local and international institutions, majorly in the banking sector. Uh, I've had an opportunity to travel and be able to work with some of our sister institutions that are in the various parts of Africa, and it has been a very enriching experience. Um, I started out my journey as an information systems analyst, yeah, so that was really majorly development of applications for SEC, and I didn't hesitate. I took on the opportunity, and uh, my life has never been the same. Currently, I'm working with the Central Bank of Uganda as a senior IT auditor. I also volunteer in some roles. Um, I, had, I have a heart to serve. So I volunteer with ISACA, um, that is our local chapter here in Uganda, as the IT governance director. And I'm also a liaison of She Leads Tech Kampala, which is a movement under ISACA to help and motivate women and mentor them into... Um, a stable and uh, fulfilling career in information uh, cybersecurity. I am a certified information systems auditor. I'm currently pursuing uh, my information systems uh, security uh, certification as well. Um, I'm a mother of two young toddlers. One is uh, five years and the other one is four years, which makes it a very interesting journey to speak to the women who are seeking to make it in the same field. Thank you for having me. I look forward to a very educative and value add session. Thank you. Thank you, Samari. Uh, Diana? Thank you, uh, Lisa. Thank you, Bridges, for this opportunity to be here and speak to 
fellow men and women, I can see in the room we have even men that have come to support us on this conversation. Um, yes, my name is Diana Agava Tukundane. I am a cyber security specialist uh, as of now, but my career didn't start out that way. I went to study telecommunication engineering and I was very excited to then into that field, but I never actually did any practice in telecom telecommunications. I straight away from university, got an opportunity to work in the bank as a network administrator, uh, which role I did for five years. And people who have been in networks, you know that that is an environment that doesn't change that often. So as I was looking at my career and saying, what is that thing that I would wake up and be excited to do every day that is changing every minute, that is exciting, uh, cyber security was one of those uh, uh, areas that I thought would give me that adventurous uh, aspect in a career. So that's how I ended up in information security. I started out as an infrastructure security personnel and have gone through different roles to get to where I am as a cyber security specialist working with the DFCU Bank here in Uganda. Uh, the journey has been interesting and I know uh, as we go on we shall be able to share our experiences um, but out outside the career I am also a, a mother and a wife of two lovely boys. I am currently as I, I attend this session I'm also doing some homeschooling because you know COVID has turned some of us into teachers and supervisors which has also brought new opportunities and shown us that we have even more capabilities than we thought we had. I also do volunteer with Somali uh, at the She Leads Tech Kampala chapter of ISACA. And uh, I have uh, on occasion been a modulator or a presenter at the ISACA conferences here in Uganda. And so I'm always, anytime I have an opportunity to share my experience, to, to inspire, other young ladies to say that this is possible, I always take it with two hands. The other thing that uh, I like talking about is that for most of my life, I was a volleyballer. I played volleyball to up to national level. So work without play makes us dull. So I am a techie and I'm also a, a social kind of person. Yeah, finally, I'm a Rotelian who loves to serve community. I'm passionate about that. And yeah, more to be shared as we go on. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies. So before we get into the, the discussion of today, we'll just run a poll. I'll ask that everyone uh, quickly participate in the poll. We'll run the poll for 30 seconds. So Steve, if you may. Uh, Lisa, the poll is running and I'm seeing some participation, so we run it for the next uh, 15 more seconds. Closing in the next 10 seconds. And the last votes coming in now. Lisa, back to you. Yes, so um, we'll just share the results um, as we wrap up the session. So great, so as we dive quickly into today's session, um, Samai, um, what would you really say is the value of a diverse leadership team? And, you know, even as we look at it from, uh, from all levels of an, of an or, or organization, what would you say is um, the key aspect of a diverse leadership team? And probably Pauline can also support um, you in that sort of uh, question. Samai, you're on mute. 
Thank you, thank you. I hope now you can hear me very well. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, so um, diversity is a new topic that is being discussed. Um, it started out from diversity in schools, uh, having girls take on uh, STEM courses, and it has grown and evolved into the workplace as well and the professional world, which is why we're here today. And uh, it has, it's a value and um, paybacks are quite immense, really. Um, one, we notice, especially in the area of cybersecurity, there is dire shortage of skills, of skilled professional, not just locally, but on the global scale. There are figures, there are statistics to prove this. So it is very important and very, it will give back, you know, it will produce more results. It will make companies more agile to doing their business in, um, in ways that can bring solutions and uh, income quickly. Once we bring on the right teams, the right resources, the right professionals, and that will include women who have gone into schools to study this. When we go to universities, we are seeing that there are women more women in STEM courses, actually, if not 50-50. So why is the, um, the, the, the professional world not absorbing them in the workplace? So they must understand that bringing more women into the field is a critical piece of the solution of, um, to address the problem that uh, they are facing. Secondly, diversity pays. It pays, it pays the company, it pays the shareholder. So it is good for business. In fact, a global study from Peterson Institute for International Economics found that uh, corporations going through, going from having no women uh, in corporate leadership to a 30% female share, so one pass one percent point increase in the net margin. So it pays off, eh? which translates to about 15% increase in profitability for a typical firm. So bringing women on board will definitely pay off because women we have uh, we have the heart to serve we are not mo we are mostly not in it for the money we are in it to give we are in it to make sure we solve problems and we bring solutions and lasting solutions to the table so it will pay off in the long run thank, thank you. you so um, much what, 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 what do you think uh, well when it comes to that one of the things i'll say is that um that diversity must be there. You know, we have to include everybody so that we bring on board. I'll give just a personal ex example where sometimes we look at the bigger picture, but really it's from the individual perspective. Some of us understood the subjects that were going to lead us into being techies, but we were discouraged by virtue of being girls. And sometimes it's just something as peer pressure from school where you are scoring high but when you look at the engineering you know when you look at all these other courses you're like no let me just do the soft tissues they are easy they are they, you know they are more gully gully so really that is something that needs to be addressed from a very early stage where the reward and the success of women in technology is actually portrayed to younger girls so that they can be able to adapt and I know that it's a world where women belong. It's not just a man's world. It's not just, you know, it's everybody's world. So to me, it is something that must be included. And because it also means that with women, you bring another level of leadership based on, well, we talk about emotions in leadership. We talk about, you know, EQ, where you are now looking at a holistic kind of management, not just one level of management. Women bring something to the table and they need to bring more to technology. So I think it's something that we must address and keep encouraging girls to do. Thank you. And I mean, I agree with uh, you both. And I think uh, diversity, you know, even in terms of thought, opinion, experience, uh, is really very effective, you know, when it's represented throughout um, an entire company. So, Diana, um, having a vast experience uh, in the implementation of cybersecurity programs in your uh, in your organization, in, and even in other large organizations, and also being a member of Helix uh, Tech, how would you say your experience has been like? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh... Lisa for that. Uh, the experience has been quite 
a, a challenge and an opportunity. And I'll speak from the experiences as they were, as I experienced them, because I believe that's how many of us will relate to. I'll give an example. When I joined my first employee into the network space, and for the five years that I was in that role, I was the only female in that unit. It was called the infrastructure unit. And the first thing I had to, to see is that how do I fit in? How do I feel welcome? Because uh, my fellow colleague, male colleagues had Friday evenings where they will say, go and eat pork. If you're not coming in and actually showing that you can hang, then they will start sidelining you. And then, so the first thing you have to do is how do I fit in? How do I create that uh, comfort around them that being female doesn't mean that I can't do what you are doing? And I've seen the ripple effect of that. Uh, when I left that role to join information security, the team was like, no, we need another female energy in this uh, area. Hadn't I held my own within that role, then I would have killed the opportunity for any other females that were coming in to do network administration. So uh, from the experience point of view, you have to find a way, number one, to fit in, to feel welcome. There's been a saying that uh, women, we have to, to do twice as much to um, prove ourselves in these roles. And that is very practical. If you want to really get in and, feel, and, and, and you're, you're respected for what you're bringing to the table, you have to go back and do more, more work. I'll give an example, if there's an, a problem that needs solving or you have, you have identified, don't just come to the team and say, guys, there's this problem. You bring the problem with your suggested solutions. They might not be the right solutions, but the fact that you're coming with showing that you made an effort to actually uh, uh, also look at what possible solutions are there, then you, 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 you hold your position in that room and then you create that environment that gives people comfort that women can do it as much as men are doing it. So my first uh, uh, experience or point to share is that when you have the opportunity, when you get the chance to put your foot in the, in, in the office, try and fit in as much as you can and then the rest will be be okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Diana. Um, Pauline, I know you have diversified a little into customer service um, for revenue generation, um, even in terms of just being a self-motivated strategic leader with experience, not just in developing and strengthening management teams, but also to see how best um, East Africa Customer Care Center can maximize organizational profit uh, throughout the service delivery. How would you say this has been for you? Well, I think for me, what I would say is that uh, you have to really rethink the model that you're going to work with in terms of who do you include? I work with the technology people. I work with people who do other softer skills. But really for me, coming from a background where I've had two explain technology to the customer. What that means is that you really have to get the soft parts to understand and interpret that technology so that you break it down. I'll give an example is like when you go, let's even just use cybersecurity. Even when you are selling to a customer or telling them this is what you need to use or this is what is going to do for you. You have to break it down so that people get to understand the basics. So I think one area of opportunity like what we do in East Africa Customer Care is to break down that technology for people to understand what it entails and of what value it is to them. I, I introduced the arm of some, you know, something like customer experience, you know, cybersecurity, but you have to look at customer experience. Mostly you're only looking at protection, but really if you think about a bank, what is it that a customer is looking for? The customer is looking for trust, security, 
that they can leave you with your money and it is safe. So they want to know that the systems that you're using cannot be hacked. So we try to interpret that now from another perspective and bring it on board for businesses. Working with people is the same. You now have to go and look for people who can be able to break down that technology. The techie who is developing, the techie who can be able to sell, and the techie who can be able to interpret for a layman what all that entails. So that's what it, we, we are all about. Thank you, Pauline. Um, and I know, uh, lastly, even as we just uh, finalize on that question, uh, Tamari, being in the banking sector and also being um, the IT governance director, how would you say your experience has been? I mean, you've served a lot of local and international institutions. So how would you really say the experience has been for you being in leadership? All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, like, like Diana has mentioned, um, in the technology world, first of all, when you join a team and you're a lady, <laughs> It, um, it's interesting. People look at you in an interesting way. They are amazed. They, they, they just can't figure out, they can't put together what it is about you that has led you into this role. Um, so they, they feel that you are, you are a, a force to recon with, uh, which is what my colleague really mentioned, that she had to, you know, to make sure that she lays the path for the other females that would fo follow her. So my experience has been exciting. I must admit it has been very exciting. Um, I have learned a lot, both in terms of the technical expectations and the technical challenges that I take on, and also relating and leading people, which has been the most important part of it, relating with people who are not techies, who don't understand the tech space, and you have to to, to, to report to them, like our leaders, you know, most of the time they are not so tech survey. So they rely on us to make sure that we interpret these things for them. And being the lady, um, it even gives you more leverage because we have a way we communicate better than the males would do. Um, being a leader, um, one, thing, one thing that led me to really go out and uh, lay as she leads here in Kampala is because having been in this space of IT audit, and I must admit that um, most of the companies that I worked for, I was the only lady on the IT audit space. <laughs> in fact, um, the, the, the unit is still small and is still growing, that in most of them, I was the only one. I was the only one doing that role. So it placed me with a challenge not that it was something that I felt so proud of, but it was rather a challenge to learn and be able to, to give the assurance that the organization can rely on to make decisions relating to technology investments and the like. So it was a challenge, it was a learning point, and uh, that is what pushed me to get into Shields because I realized, no, you can't always be the only one in this role. There has to be people that can come in and you work together and what is stopping this, what is the challenge? And most of the challenges were lack of confidence, um, lack of um, trust, people not being informed and not being aware, which is what we are trying to do at SHILITS and uh, governance of IT. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Samari. And um, you know, it's interesting when to see that uh, researchers have found that some of the most common reasons why women do not pursue careers into technology is because of the gender gap. So, um, Diana, just quickly, what do you um, really think are the reasons, some of the reasons that gender gap is being experienced um, in the space of technology and even in terms of leadership? Uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, and I, I think Pauline hinted on it in her first submission. We have a structural issue in terms of, we can start from education. And I'll give my own experience. I was in a single girls school, but when it would get to, to higher, what we call A level here, you'd find two streams are dedicated to arts and one stream is dedicated to science, people who are doing sciences. Within the school, they're already putting in your mind that notion that, you know what, one, sciences are for the selected few, 
and those that are, you know, that are, that, that can try the hard things. And, 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 and some of us maybe took that route, I'll give an example. My father was a math teacher and, and it, was, it was in me that I wanted to, to please him to show, you know what, how can your father teach mathematics and that's the subject that you're failing. So that is what motivated me to, from an early childhood stage to actually pursue that. But you find young girls, even at family level, they do not have that role model that will inspire them to do that. So with that lack of that model at young age, then you get into a structure of education that is always telling you, these things are for men. You go to, we have a school here called Budo. When they are taking uh, students at S1, they are taking 300 boys and 60 females. So we have to go back to the grassroots and actually change the narrative. We have to go back, even this mentorship as she leads that we're trying to do. Yes, it is needed at organizational level, but by the time I'm getting employed, I have been kind of molded. They say you can, uh, uh, you can only bend a, a stick when it's still young. So if, if I'm getting to uh, 20s and joining my career and the last 20 years, this is what has been implanted in me, it becomes a little difficult to change it there. We shall still try at this level. And I think some of these webinars are going to help us to achieve it at professional level. But for us to get a shift, to get uh, the gap narrowed, it has to go back to how we are mentoring our kids right from families to the education system. And then we shall be able to say, okay, now this gap can be dealt. The other aspect of course, is it, is, it, it has to be inbuilt. There are things that you can't force. So I like a book that talks about grit. There's nowhere, there's nowhere in school they teach us passion, they teach us, you know, so it's again mentorship. You hear this over and over again, drummed into you, and then you can be inspired to take that journey. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Samai Sam, Sam, seems to have um, a comment on that. Samai, probably, why do you think um, women uh, are really not given these opportunities in, in terms of the leadership? Um, I would like to resonate with uh, the previous speaker. We start from a complex set of structural and cultural issues that are very incompatible with the value system of the IT industry. So, um, well, we also have an issue of um, perception, awareness, and biases. Well, leave alone the structure, the culture, and the structural issues that we've talked about we constantly see an issue in perception. What do I mean by perception? The way in which something is regarded, understood, or interpreted. Um, we also have awareness. And what do I mean by awareness? This is the state of being conscious of something. More specifically, it is the ability to directly know and perceive, to feel, or to be, uh, or to be cognizant of events. So, uh, so the main reason they don't pursue opportunities in IT is because they're not aware of them. I was speaking at a webinar some time back and um, I was telling them that, that, you know what, when you get to meet a man in the same space, okay, whatever profession it will be, and a woman, you realize that the men are very enthusiastic about their jobs and their professions and what they're doing. If he's playing a sport, he is very energetic about it. He will subscribe to all the professional, you know, reads that there are about that sport. He will watch the people that have been successful in that sport before, how they succeeded, what made them fail, how can I be better? He will practice it. He will be, it will be his life. It is his living. It's engraved in him. Well, from my observation, to be sincere, I have noticed that for us ladies, we tend to be laid back. We tend to let nature take its course and then we flow and fall into the, you know, the flow of nature. So we are not, we end up not being go-getters. We end up not being intentional. Actually, the word is intentional. We end up not being intentional about our profession and where we want it to take us. So you will find very few women having alerts, uh, SMS alerts for tech news that are happening, you know, of uh, cybersecurity or in technology. There are few that will be subscribing, actively subscription, subscribing to 
technology related blogs and feeds and they will not pay for some of these things but a man will go out of his way and even pay a subscription fee to in in order to get information about the latest technology trends that are happening so we need to work on that area of awareness and then also bias bias is is another area we are trying to tackle um this is an inclination or prejudice against a person or a group especially in a way that is considered to be unfair that is what diana was talking about right away from school from the way we were raised uh from the way even board design uh, games you'll notice that these these uh, games on the phones as our children are growing up and they're beginning to play games on their phones most of these games are inclined to the men to the boys the racing football what you know so you find most of them they 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 are catch they catch the attention of the boys than the girls so right from the grassroots something also uh, needs to be done thank you uh thank you and um uh, it's interesting uh, in this digitally savvy age, um, how do we go about defining customer service when we give that to our customers? I mean, technology has really been uh, an impetus for growth, uh, progress, and now that uh, we have East Africa customer care, this has really been an opportunity where uh, you, you, uh, you uh, guys, for you, have really taken it into a new height, especially just trying to see how you can improve on that particular aspect. How has this been for you? And even in line with uh, technology and cyber security, how has this progress been um, for East Africa customer care? I think from my perspective, number one is I said, let's stop thinking just technology, but think about the customer. That is the, maybe what I would bring on board. What do I mean by that? Is that you bring simplicity into the process because when you're building the technologies be it of any form let's think about the customer and let's think about what the customer really understands and what the customer wants the other thing i would say is you know i talked about it is that customers want to feel secure so when you're in uh, cyber security you are you know sometimes we, we we portray from the side of you know potential threats you know that is what we hear as lemon but reality is we are looking at how can you make sure that when you talk about cyber security it becomes the norm that i know in my business i need it and i need it because it is about me it is not because somebody prescribed it from an it perspective so breaking it down to that the other thing is that you know ensuring that even employees within an organization understand what cyber security is what it does for business and how they can be able now to disseminate this information to other users you know like when samari talks about audit you know or diana about you know it audit what do you what is the first you know idea that comes to mind when your first customer who is the, the internal customer the employee what do they think the first thing i'll tell you they think is that you're snooping looking around to see exactly what is going wrong fact so how do you now bring it into a positive energy and actually now break that technology to actually have meaningful use that i'm seeing i'm not hacked phishing my mails are not being read by somebody else it guys reading they have too much access you know bring it down and break it down and let people now know what technology means for them and their for their lives and what they value but also look at um ensuring that you know you sell the idea of a secure infrastructure so that everybody knows, you know, you're doing it from a positive perspective. I think I've dealt on that. And then when we talk about customer experience, we are looking at points of interactions, touch points, where you're saying, as long as I have these touch points, then am I safe? When I'm buying something using my card, my bank card, am I safe? Am I safe online? Am I safe at the ATM? 
am I safe to do anything with this card to upgrade, to go and change it? You know, all this, this is, needs to be encompassed so that you're saying the underlying security is what we have put in place to ensure that you can never be hurt, your money is safe, or whatever information you are, have. When I want to put my information on the cloud, am I safe? What does it entail? So then what comes to mind then again is you must educate the customer and break it down to the T. So I think that for me would be more about it, incorporating the customer education and understanding while you're doing the cybersecurity. I think that would be that for now. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. And I see even just going to our chat section, um, we have someone ask, what role do you think men can do to break the structural issues that hinder girls from pursuing STEM disciplines? And we have, uh, you know, just a comment from uh, Helen, who thinks that, you know, when we put in place a diversity policy with gender balance as one of the guidelines, is one of the key things that could be done. Uh, Businge, Kevin thinks that men can spearhead the mentorship rule that empowers the other gender. So it's also interesting to see that our participants have um, a perspective into how they think uh, we should drive this um, uh, interesting conversation. Great. So, um, Samai, uh, I mean, just uh, um, even as we now dwell uh, deeply into what uh, one of the participants has asked, is there a way you think we could engage men in the field of technology, uh, even in leadership and cybersecurity, to probably help in advancing more women in the industry from not just a board level, but also to senior management? Okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, there's a lot that men can do um, to help women, to motivate women, to lift up women. Uh, one, they must first understand the unconscious biases that they are emitting out to the women, you know, in their spaces. Uh, sometimes we do it unconsciously. We don't know that the things we're doing are discouraging, you know, the, the ladies that we're dealing with. Uh, Diana mentioned something that, you know, she had to fit in. She had to go for pork. She had, I, I mean, what if I don't want to go for pork, you know? I, but you'll end up sidelining me because while we are having that pork is where we those important discussions take place from and then tomorrow on monday we'll be on our desk and i'll say ah okay we agree that you do this x y z and z and i'll be on my desk and i don't know what just happened because i couldn't join you maybe because i have a baby because i have a family because i had to take somebody to the hospital so that unconscious bias number one our male colleagues need to first get to know it in order to address it. Number two, they can be our allies, you know, their own boards, their own ex co committees, their own different steering committees. So be our allies, um, facilitate and encourage and direct policies that will make sure that the women are, are given uh, favorable working conditions, not to favor them beyond others, no, but to make sure that the working conditions are equal for both genders, you know, we have a fair and equal, for example, we can have a policy on fair and equitable remuneration. This is no secret. This is no secret. It is very clear that for the same role, you'll find a lady being paid less, yet they are doing more work than the men they are doing they are putting in more because you'll find men most of the time using company internet to pursue their own things they are trying to buy land build houses whoa, whoa, all that but a woman is dedicated she comes in the morning she sits on her computer starts on the job that is expected of her and she does it excellently and you know by the nature of who we are we are is it correct you know when you correct the women they know what to do so there should be fair and equitable remuneration schemes in companies. Number two, let us have women on HR, on HR recruitment teams, which is really what is happening. But as we have them there, they should be listened to and, and heard. Also, when we are putting out um, recruitment adverts, let the language not be cod coded language that kind of discourages men. There's a way you write an advert and, you know, 
the woman will just not take it up <laughs> by the way it is written maybe you say you are able to work extended hours and uh, maybe a woman who is just preparing her wedding will not be able to do this because she knows there are some other expectations to balance it up then men can also take on uh, parental leave and be able to assist um, women in areas where so that they can, these women are free and feel safe to go to work and put in, put in their whole energy in uh, whatever they are doing. Then also we can encourage male advocacy. The men can come up, um, be a voice for the women. And uh, lastly, but not least, because there are many, but lastly, uh, be mentors. Men out there, get out of your shells and mentor women. I must appreciate the men in my life because I am where I am because I got men that mentored me. I got men that showed me what steps to take, what to do. In fact, when I did my CISA, uh, I remember I was encouraged by a man. You know, he told me, don't be scared, go ahead, do it. And I remember I also had a boss at that time. I think he had tried it and failed it and we made the bet. <laughs> so he told me, if you pass it, I'm going to give you money. So we were on a bet. I said, I'm going to ace this thing. And indeed I sat down read for the exam and and i passed it on first attempt so i was encouraged by the women in my by the men in my life so that is a role that they can play there's quite a lot that they can do sincerely to to encourage the women and close this um gender diversity gap thank you thank you so much thank you for that um looking at uh you, Pauline, just being a founder of uh, East Africa Customer Care Center, what really would you say is the kind of risk muscle that you, as uh, Pauline, uh, is able to put in place? And how do you think you'd flex it even with your, within your organization to ensure there is a need to close this gap? I think number one is uh, to understand that you have to do, protect what you have, and so risk becomes something that you must mitigate. You also know when you own your own company, you carry the risk. So you have to ensure that you mitigate this. And obviously that becomes very key. So you have to look out and ensure that you protect your business fully and understand what it is that you are protecting. And it doesn't matter whether you are an IT guru or not you have to keep upgrading to understand the other thing like you know from even a gender perspective is to know as ladies you know when it comes to understanding risk cyber crime and all that we really take it for granted but the reality is that you have to read understand know seek knowledge from others consult the same men that you're talking about because they are the ones who have had their first mover advantage to understand what it is that you need to do around your business. And then that also becomes something that you advise other businesses on. And because now you are doing it from a practical perspective, not just from, you know, the, I was told it is now I have done. I believe I can take it up. I know what it does for me. I can see the, you know, the threats, the attempts, and this is how it has been mitigated. And then also what that happens is that you build a relationship with your provider because this is the person who protects your business. So it becomes the person who shields you. So those are some of the things that come out. And that, those are the stories now that we tell because as we belong to the side of telling the stories about the risks that we encountered and also how we mitigated them. So that's the way I would look at it. Samari, what, do you, what, what would you say, um, what would you say, um, you know, even being a member of the Isaka Foundation, what would you say uh, is that the Isaka Foundation has really done to try and see how best they can close this gap. Samari, you're on mute. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. Uh, what we do at Isaka, first of all, we try to understand the demographics. We get to look at the people who are registering for the different courses, how many have certified, and um, through that, it will help us to target our engagements. When we are having conferences, it will help us to know the kind of speakers to invite and um, how they're going to impact our audience. That is one. Number two, we have taken on she leads and we've taken it on um, with quite some energy. We have had a number of webinars. Right now we are running a mentorship program and it has been running for about since 2017, 2018, 20. So now we, we are in our fourth year of this mentorship program where we invite um, more experienced ladies and we tag them or we attach them to less experienced ones or even really young ones who are looking to grow their career in, uh, in InfoSec. Sometimes from my experience, I have a mentor and I met her at Isaka and uh, she has not really helped me become better in a technical way, but she has helped my other side, the networking side, the soft skill side to polish it up, you know, to be able to prepare me for those leadership roles that don't necessarily um, invite us to be very tech savvy, you know. Um, another thing we are doing, we are reaching out to university students at She Leads Tech, that is uh, part of ISACA. We are reaching out to university students. We are visiting various universities in Uganda and creating working relationships. We have memorandums of understanding with these universities to encourage the ladies that are in the, um, in the STEM courses not to fear, to show them that, you know what, you can do this, you can do this, we can mentor you, and when you come out of it, it will be easier for you to place yourself and uh, place yourself for an opportunity and be able to, to take it on. Yeah, so we are reaching out to the universities, we are encouraging the people who are already in the field, and we are also putting out awareness what we are doing. We are lucky that uh, Yale Bridges reached out to us, thank you so much. And through also webinars like these ones, we are able to show and to speak to these ladies that you know what, you can make it through sharing our personal stories and how we have reached where we are. Thank you. Thank you so much. As, um, as we also get into uh, that particular discussion, maybe one of the participants says, please expound on the importance of mentorship, how to find an ideal mentor like this relationship for each other's benefits. Um, probably Diana, you'd want to respond to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lisa, I, I can start from my experience given that I am a mentor uh, with the shades and I was uh, able to mentor one of the girls in, through the last year. But what I discovered, and uh, this is what I'm trying to we need to have a different levels of mentorship because uh, when you have a mentor who is already uh, say the CIO, CISO of an organization and yet you're starting out at IT service desk, you might not be able to relate. So I'm a very big fan of um, the current CEO uh, of uh, Facebook uh, Sherry Sandbank. She, she wrote a book, Lean In, and from that book she went on to create kind of a mentorship program uh, where you create Lean In circles uh, and I've been trying to encourage that within my peers that we can mentor each other at the level we are in because much as we are all, the fact that we're in different organizations, same role, that the culture of the organization brings a different experience to me than what I'm experiencing. So one, we need to layer the different levels of mentorship. Yes, you can have a mentorship that is at a higher level, but what is critical for us to first enjoy and embrace mentorship is to have peer-to-peer -peer mentorship because you can easily relate, uh, you can easily, you have a lot in common. But sometimes when you talk to someone who is already a president, your mind is like, ah, she was lucky, how did she get there? You're focused on where they are now instead of focusing on how the journey they went through to get there. 
and, 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 and I'm hoping that even as we do mentorship, we demystify what leadership is. At every step of the way, can you try to be the leader in that role? Let us not look at titles as, as what makes us leaders as ladies. I gave an example. When I was in the network environment where there are only males, I played a leadership role to say, I'm going to make sure I excel at this level and create an opportunity that the next lady can also be put there. And that's how we have to approach that. If I'm right now in the cybersecurity space, am I, I'm an IT specialist, I have a manager, but can I play a leadership role within my current role to show that, you know what? Um, someone who is looking at me saying, oh, that, that is also an opportunity of leadership being at that role. So um, um, my, my analogy about mentorship is that, yes, mentorship is important, but it needs to be layered. You have a peer-to-peer, -peer. you even have uh, at school level, you have different schools like uh, Samali has been saying, much as I'm going to a secondary school to mentor them, they would want to get an opinion from a similar secondary school and what they picked from the mentorship that we give them, did, are they on the same page? So we need to layer the different mentorship levels so that by the time someone is mentoring you at COO, you find that you're comfortable with what the benefits of mentorship comes with. Thank you. Maybe I can add to that. Yes, just, yeah, yeah. Maybe I can just add to that. I think um, I'm just even reading the comments that are coming through. And maybe for Mary Grace, you know, mentorship is not being had held fully. Sometimes it is also the initiative that you show towards what you really want to achieve. You can only be a mentored when you really have a vision yourself so that somebody just shows you where to step. That is one of the things. And also to Diana's point, remember you can only be mentored at the level where you are operating. So you have to look within your network around you so that the people around you can actually show you the next step more clearly because some people will have forgotten about it. And my, I, I am also looking at a comment from Deborah. And uh, one of the things that as much as we talk about gender, and I can even use my personal experience, is that you really have to believe in yourself. And as a lady, I tell you, you must work double. If you want to be heard, if you want to be seen, you have to work very hard and to put yourself out there and say, I am just as good. But you cannot necessarily say it by word of mouth, but your performance, your output, whatever it is that you are, you know, the value that you are bringing to the table must be seen. And it is the way it is because sometimes we want to fight it from a perspective of we must be hard, but we must be hard now. But if you look at these imbalances, they have not, they did not start yesterday. So it is not something that we are going to um, make good just immediately. It is something that we have to work progressively towards. And that's why I'm saying for the ladies who are at the table, they also have to come back and pick the ones who are still getting there. I call it shortening the journey so that you can actually be able now to bring together what it is that you did, the mistakes you made. Don't watch others making the mistakes that you made shorten their journey. The other thing that I would say is that when you get to that level, particularly if you're sitting at C-suite or you have gotten to that leadership role, remember now you stop being the IT person and now you must take over the leadership role. But sometimes we miss to make that trans, you know, transition to just forget that we are studying on one pillar, but now we are studying on a holistic, uh, uh, you know, on very many legs to say the least you have to be the mentor you have to be to to motivate people you have to steer a vision strategy so really it is that whole transformation as ladies that we must also encompass if you are going to make it and make it even in technology and not just in technology because from technology you become a leader 
championing through technology. So that is the advantage then that becomes. That's my two cents for that one. Uh, thank you, Pauline. And probably just um, one more question for you. Um, also being just a, a founder of the ESCCC, um, is, are there any mentorship programs that uh, your organization runs for women in leadership and probably just to help them advance into this uh, specified leadership position? Yes, I would say one of the things that we do is we have uh, for the customer experience professionals, we have something we call evening conversations where we are brought in a, a number of, <laughs> all right, uh, Loa, don't worry, it is all the gender issues that we experience at work. Can hear the baby crying. So what we have is something we call evening conversations for the customer experience professionals, and particularly not the strategic level, but a lower level so that we can be able to show them how to bring that role to the table of decision making. So we run that, it is a group we have, and then we just champion. Two, and, and I've seen Steve Mambo has put my LinkedIn profile there, we are easy to reach. The challenge we have as ladies, we do not have continuity. If you look at most uh, mentorship programs by ladies, particularly those who have been senior, they lack availability. They do not create time for the younger generation, for the younger people to bring together. So some of the things is just even just going to our LinkedIn, you can ask your questions and then we can see how much we can be able to contribute. That's how we do it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Pauline. Um, and I know uh, there's been a lot of sponsorship platforms or other initiatives for women in uh, technology just to help them see how best they can advance in their careers. And Samai, away from what Isaka Foundation is doing, I know you've also gained some knowledge through Milima Academy by one of our partners in Uganda, Milima Security. How really has that uh, been of uh, resource to you and how has that helped you? Okay, thank you so much. Um, I've had the opportunity to associate with Milima and um, they are doing a beautiful thing, which is they're demystifying the whole um, mystery that sounds technology and information technology which is what uh, Pauline is trying to break down for us today in this, uh, in this webinar. Um, you know, you go to school and you pick all this theory in the university because of the numbers, because of the resources that are available. And what Milima has done, it has taken that aside and said, yeah, thank you. You got this theory, you got all this packed information, but we're here to take you on a step-by-step -step journey on how you can make it in this practical world. So what Milima does for us is... Um, they bring for us special packaged um, courses that are very marketable in the workplace that um, can boost you and give you a push as you go on those panels and help you to answer those questions. And also, most importantly, that will ensure that you perform the role that you are given to perform to the expectations of your employer. So what it has done is bring the practical perspective home for us. So it will give you the practice on the penetration testing, on the cyber security, on the vulnerability assessments, incident management, customer management, whatever it is that you are looking for, the domain that you're looking to specialize in to get a grip on, they interpret it for you in a very practical sense, which is what every employer is looking for. So they have covered a very big gap for us uh, in terms of the graduates having too much theory and very little practical. Thank you. Thank you, Samai. Um, I'll just ask Steve to run the results of the previous poll that we've had to participate in so that we can all see the results. Steve, if you may. Yes, Lisa, it's already on. Great. So I, th I think um, it's, it's very interesting to see um, the kind of results that we have and, and probably just this, you know, um, means that uh, there's a particular way in which we all have a different perspective in terms of how we interpret leadership and 
and, and management. So, um, Pauline, probably, uh, what would be your take in terms of the poll that we've just run? Pauline? For me, for me, in a time of crisis, it's leadership first because you must set the tone and direction of where you are going. I think if you just look at, I, I don't even want to use technology, just the COVID experience. People need to be steered towards a direction, safety. A leader has to make a decision and then management can come in and execute. For me, it is as simple as that. How do you, you as a leader, you must now come up with a decision, say, this is where we are going, this is what ought to be done, what do you think, brings in the management to ensure that every aspect of that decision is broken down, and then you can actually manage the crisis from that perspective. But without uh, the leadership coming in fast, without direction, then you have, you leave, a room for people to run in all directions with different decisions, different execution modes. So the, at that particular time, even the type of leadership matters. And that is sometimes when you find that, you know, autocracy sometimes works in a time of crisis because you have to say, let us do this, let us move this way because of time and the fact that of what, you know, whatever it starts to be at risk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Um, so um, as we uh, as we finalize on the session, day session, um, Diana, I don't know whether um, this, I, I don't know what advice you'd want to give uh, to even the participants that are within the session. Probably just give them um, one or two words in terms of what areas to probably focus on and how to go about mentorship programs what advice would you give to them to be able to thrive in this kind of industry um, thank you Lisa um, I'll start with the mentorship uh, aspect of it first of all uh, as a person you have to believe in the mentorship ideology you have to believe that it, it, will, it will add good to you, it will be beneficial to you. And, 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 and from my experience, even when you look around, we do not have, especially in cybersecurity, we do not have many people we can look up to currently in Uganda, I can tell you that. So then what happens if you're looking around and maybe you're, you're only 10 people doing cybersecurity right now, Will you give up on mentorship? We are living in a digital world that sometimes you do not have to actually have that person-to-person -person, uh, uh, contact to actually be mentored. So one of the things I have been doing, and that's what Mary was talking about, subscribing to, to tech news or looking out for people that are excelling in this field, number one, follow them. Once you have followed them, they're always sharing insights. They're always indirectly mentoring you. There's an example, there's a lady called Patricia from, uh, she's Kenyan and she runs a transformational uh, program. I've forgotten the other name. So when I was talking to my former boss in my workplace, I'm saying I've been looking for a mentor. She was, he was like, I can connect you to Patricia, but you know the first step you need to do? First go online, learn as much about her as you can, and, and that's what I did. I first went to LinkedIn and sent her a request for following and, and I was seated there shaking, saying her, she's a big person. She actually mentors CEOs and eh, I know she's on the mentorship list for Standard Bank. That's how high she is in terms of mentorship. And I thought she wouldn't actually accept my, the moment she, she followed me back, I, I quickly ran to and this is a gentleman who's actually trying to give me advice about mentorship. Quickly saying, you know what? She has accepted my, my request. Now she's my friend. So I'm going to keep liking her, her posts or commenting. So by the time this other person introduces me to, to her, she could quickly say, I think I've seen your profile on LinkedIn. So we, you have to find creative ways to even attract mentors to yourself. 
that is one thing about mentorship. The other thing, um, what can the ladies do to start preparing themselves? You might not be a leader now, but how do you prepare yourself for the leadership role ahead of you? I, I normally tell people once I feel that I've done the best I can do. If opportunities are not coming, shame on them. But where I'm seated, I am, am I ready for that opportunity if it fell down right now? So I'm talking about preparing yourself. Um, I follow another gentleman who, who coaches people called Tony Robbins and he told us that if you, if you just rely on standard education, you'll become a standard person and a standard employee. If you want to be something extraordinary, self-education is key. So how much are you going out there to educate yourself? Uh, I'll give an experience that I'm going through right now. There's this RSA conference. It's one of the top conferences in cybersecurity. And, at, and to attend it, you have to pay thousands of dollars. But due to COVID, they opened it and gave uh, free attendance to whoever registered. And, and I was like, COVID, much as it's a challenge, has brought an opportunity for me to actually achieve my dream of attending this conference. And for three days, I've been multitasking, working from home while attending the conference, and the insights I'm getting from there are immense. And that is also a way of mentorship. So my, my advice is that as ladies, if we want it, we have to actually one positions, uh, position ourselves to get it and, and, and put ourselves there. I'll, find, I'll, I'll, I'll also, I like sharing from experience, I'll share the final experience of last year and how I got to sit my CISSP exam. I set out at the beginning of the year, I said, money or no money, I want to sit the CISSP exam. And January I started reading, I know the exam is expensive, $700 or so, but I said, me, let me prepare myself. And every time I'd meet my boss, I'd tell them, by the way, I'm reading for CISSP. And guess what? The bank comes up and they had an audit finding of you, your, your resources are not well uh, trained. And, and, and the bank had to quickly get someone to train to do CISSP so that they can close that issue. When they were looking around, who was ready? It was me. And, 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 and being ready that time, there was a boot camp starting in two weeks, which again was cancelled and you could easily tell them, ah, now if I can't go for the boot camp, I can't sit for the certification. But because I'd been preparing, when the boot camp was cancelled, I told the management, I said, give me that money, I will still go to Macquarie University, register sit that exam and, and pass it. Hadn't I been ready, because you can't prepare for that exam in two weeks, hadn't I been ready, I would have yes gone and failed because some, most of us have done these uh, examinations and we know how tough they are so prepare prepare set yourself in a position that when an opportunity comes you're ready for it thank you i hope i didn't overshoot my time no no not at all diana thank you for that um a question i'd like to pose to you samai um emily from the uh, participants is asking how would you encourage ladies at the CSET level to speak up in the boardroom. Oftentimes they sit near the door or near the tea table. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I will just add on to what Pauline already mentioned about this. Ladies, we need to believe in ourselves. We need to have confidence in ourselves. Um, one thing I've noticed is that a man, if a male does not know how to do a particular task, they will not say no. They will not say they don't know. They will say, give it to me. And they will, I don't know, they will figure it out along the way and they will bring you results. And when the results are not your expectations, it will not discourage them. They will go back and make sure they, until they get it right. Uh, while on our side, um, we tend to get emotional about criticism and about how things get done. And we don't, like Diana has said, we don't get out of our, we don't push ourselves. We don't teach ourselves. We are not out there to learn by our own selves. We expect somebody to always hold our hand in order to succeed. So in order to push yourself to the sweet switch, number one, I will repeat or re echo what the speakers have been saying. Are you leading in the position where you are? Because there's no way you're going to be given a vote of confidence at the Swiss suit when as an IT 
support person, people would be calling you to fix a broken cable and you take hours to turn up to fix for them. Nobody's going to give you that vote of confidence because people are watching you. People are watching what you are doing. You know, if I'm going to call you and tell you I, my computer is down and uh, you keep me on the call for, you know, for an, an hour and you're not responding to me, I lock my ticket and you're not responding to me. How, how are you going to get this confidence, you know? A uh, vote of confidence, even leave alone people giving you a vote of confidence. Um, I'm sorry to digress a bit, but I mean, these things are spiritual. You don't expect to be given when you've not done good with the, the, the small that you've been given. You know, too much is given, much is expected. So how are you serving where you are? People are watching you and they will promote you based on what you have done with what you were given. So work on that make sure you excel at it and develop other skills find a mentor in those spaces somebody that you look up to somebody that you've seen their steps and how they've gone through them follow in their footsteps understand yourself know who you are um i i, I was telling somebody that do a SWOT analysis on yourself know your strengths your weaknesses the opportunities that you have and the threats that can easily bring you down and work towards strengthening those that are strong and you know uh, weakening those other weak areas or doing away with them. Prepare, like Dana said, prepare, prepare, prepare for the role that you want. Get to know what you want to do. Do you want to be a CEO? Understand, who, who CEOs, most of the time, what are their qualifications? What do they do? Get to know what they do and walk in those sorts of footsteps. Be prepared for opportunities. Study everything that you feel will lead you to that area that you want to go. Polish up on your soft skills, you know, communication. Learn how to communicate. That is what Pauline is trying to tell us here today. Learn how to communicate both written and oral. Have the right grammar, the right spelling, the right English. There's nothing that, you know, ticks off um, a C-level person like wrong grammar or an incorrect spelling. So learn your communication, learn negotiation skills, because what these people do in these meetings is negotiate decisions. They negotiate decisions. No, we want to, this, this, to take on this project. No, we will not take it on. Can you justify why we must put money in a, in a, in a, in a solution? We can use Excel. Why do you want an analytics tool? So you're going to negotiate on behalf of your team why you want that analytics tool. You're going to negotiate why you need a new team member on your team. You're going to negotiate why the company must invest in a new server, yet what they have is still, you know, working for them. So work on your negotiation skills as well. Uh, serve your profession. Uh, it is very rare that you'll find a leader at the sea level who is not into service. I, I, they could be there, but they're rare. They're really rare. Most of these people serve their professions. What I am, do I mean by that? Volunteer, get volunteer roles, be out there, you know, show that you have an interest and a passion for what you do. And I mean, the sky is the limit. Believe in yourself, have confidence in who you are and trust in God. If he led you on this path and started you on it, surely he'll bring it to a perfect completion. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Thank Hello. you. Thank you, Samai, for that. Okay. Um, I'd like to pose this next question to Pauline. Um, so Lillian is asking, how do you advise women to push for leadership or management roles in organizations without coming off as strong? Wow. I think for me, number one is that you you, you need to chart your own career path. I hear people always saying there's no career path in this organization or oh, I need to grow. But that for me is that you must own your journey. That is the first thing that you must do, that you sit back and you say, what do I want to do? What do I see ahead of me? Number two is, like we said, as much as you can uh, be able to get somebody above you, the next step that you want to take to be able to mentor you, to show you how to shorten the journey, like I said before. So that becomes very key in your movement and upward movement or the vertical movement towards the 
office that you want to occupy. It is not easy for ladies, and I'll repeat because it's a journey I have walked, it is not easy. You have to work hard and you have to put your results on the table. When you put your results on the table, don't also put it for others. Because sometimes what happens, and I, I know this is a general complaint, is that you go, you do your report, you do everything, then somebody comes and picks and they go and they do the reporting for you. So you are always in the background. And it's something that as ladies that we must also avoid and find a way to get to the table to just have our little voice be heard. How do you that do that? Don't sit back in meetings and wait for people to articulate the issues. So many times we sit there, we have the answers, we have the solutions, but we let our, particularly our male colleagues or the people with a big voice like me speak up. So what do you do? You go back, your ideas are picked by others. Sometimes they're even half-baked. They executed badly, yet you had the solution from the start. And I know we are all guilty about this. Ladies, get to the table. When your opportunity comes, articulate your issues in a feminine voice. And I repeat, in a feminine voice. The one advice I was given by a male boss is, you see, it is so hard to put you at the table because you're here, you're just another guy. Wear your dress. I am not saying do anything, but wear your dress and use what God gave you to be able to put your point through. And that is one mistake we make. We want to shout over the men at the tables. They do not give us the opportunity, yet they are the ones who are there. I talked about the fact that you need to package yourself so that people really trust you. That Diana, when I look at you, you are the go-to person. You know your staff. At no point are you saying, oh, I don't know that. I need to refer. Oh, let me come back to you next week. You get. Then also, as much as we have, and I'm seeing someone asking about the work-life balance, let us also not include so much of ourselves in the things that really do not matter at work. And I'm not saying do not be a woman, do not be a mother. Let that package, holistic package come to work because you are a whole person. But as much as you bring, let it also not be a barrier because what happens? I say, oh, I have, a, I need to do this with my baby on this day. Then you are told no. What happens? You get angry. You get the wrong attitude you start getting rated the wrong way. But if you articulate and say, in ample, you know, time, give notice, you're able to communicate effectively about who you really are as Samari or as Diana, then people now start respecting you from that perspective. Pauline is a mother. Pauline, every other Friday of the week, she takes her child too. You get, people now embrace you as you are. But if you go with this attitude that us ladies go with, like, but you understand that I'm a mother, I need to take my child too, because that's how we go in. So really effective communication is very, very uh, uh, important. Then raise your voice when you have to. Do not be bypassed by promotions just because you're sitting back and the gentlemen, because they can be able to meet after work for pork, get all the position sit back and say, I think I deserve this position because of X, Y, Z. So put through your case also without being overly emotional, but actually tabulating what it is that you have delivered and what you can actually deliver more. I also say that as a lady, you will work twice as hard to be hard. Stop complaining. You have to put in the hours at the beginning and then it becomes much, much better. Will you still suffer discrimination at the top level? Yes. What you do with that is what really matters, that you know and you're conscious that these biases that we have talked about come into play, but you learn how to overcome them until people realize that what you are articulating, what you are delivering, 
they can almost not do without you. So they now start inviting you and it's just rejection at the beginning. Quickly, you get to the table and they appreciate you. That would be my two cents. Wow, um, thank you so much, Pauline, for that. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's very, very, it's, it's such a good thing to see that uh, there's been a lot of participation from uh, the participants and really just thinking out um, about the kind of conversation that we've had. I mean, changing our culture when it comes to this particular kind of stereotype we have for each other in terms of the uh, gender and how would want to start a great place. Um, I think this is also an opportunity to change things right now when it comes to how best we can model um, an effective way in terms of how leadership should look like. And this should not just be in courage, but even in confidence. You know, it's, it's really time for us to change not only uh, the diversity among our leadership team, but also try and see how to create a new form of leadership. And it's also quite interesting to see that uh, being respective leaders uh, in various organizations and in various capacities, instead of trying to also uh, squeeze ourselves into uh, the old accustomed ways of working, it's also vital that we are able to look into ways in terms of how we can invest heavily in time and even resources for opportunities to shift our, on our organizations and probably even evolve more from a more balanced, diverse, and ultimately even a resilient way of, of leadership. So just before we wrap up, um, I know uh, they, <laughs> we've, we've been told that all good things at, at some point must come to an end. Um, so I will request Steve, Steve Mambo to probably give his final remarks as we, as we wrap up the session. Steve? Thanks a lot, Lisa. Thanks a lot to Pauline, Diana, and Samari. This has been a very interesting and insightful conversation. And um, sitting at the back here and trying to listen through this uh, conversation, I think there are quite a number of things that both men and women need to learn about this uh, conversation of gender balance, and also in the technology space. And I think I like that we even diverged and went further away, not just to look at technology and cybersecurity. And I would also want to thank uh, the men who are bold enough to be on part of this conversation. I can assure you, we are all your ambassadors uh, after this session. And it is now our responsibility to go out there and preach the same message. Uh, the same conversation that we've had uh, on this webinar. It's a conversation, it's an ongoing conversation. I think one of the um, panelists mentioned that this is not something that we'll address tomorrow or the day after. There is that continuity, but it starts with that one step. Uh, the gentlemen who are on this uh, uh, call, what's your responsibility in ensuring that we have a gender balance? In Kenya, we talk about two third rules, but for me, I'm always, it should always be a 50% 50, 50 uh, share. Because all of us bring in something special on the table. And uh, for the ladies who are also on part of this webinar, I'd also pass the same message also to your colleagues that that space is available for you. So uh, as we spoke about the mentorship programs, I think that is also very critical. And I think it's also important as we discuss these mentorship um, um, uh, programs, it's also important to bring in men into that conversation so that we know what role we are going to play to promote uh, that equality and balance at our workplaces. So this has been a great conversation. As I think you can pick up, I've picked quite a number of lessons to be implemented uh, where I work and also to my friends and colleagues that uh, we keep on engaging. So once more, thanks a lot for being part of this session. Thanks to also the panel, uh, the participants who are also asking questions, sharing feedback. I think that's how we all of us contribute to this conversation. And without much, uh, uh, much ado, I'd like to end the session, but also remind you that in the coming week on Friday, the 25th, July, we have another webinar, but now this time we'll be discussing about Manage Security Service and the impact uh, it has to organizations. Once more, thanks a lot and uh, enjoy the, uh, the rest of the week, and, or rather the weekend. Thank you. Back to you, Lisa. Thank you, Steve. Um, so many, many thanks to the panelists, Pauline, Samai, and Diana 
for creating time to just share your vast experiences and the learnings that you've picked up along the way. So really, thank you for sharing the time and to our participants. Uh, thank you for also creating time to be part of us. Uh, it's really such a good thing to see that um, a lot of women have taken uh, this particular opportunity to just be a part of this session and to air out their views and to um, get uh, an opportunity or a platform to share their questions and probably even see um, the best ways in which they can interact. So thank you very much to everyone. Um, please stay safe, uh, be your brother's keeper, and let's meet in the next coming webinar. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Diana. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you, Steve. It was a pleasure. Thank you.